Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. One day a rich young man approached Jesus with a nagging question. Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? How many times have you heard that question? How many times have you asked that question? To help this well-intentioned man realize that he had boarded the wrong train, Jesus replies, if you would enter eternal life, keep the commandments. To which this young man actually said, well, which ones? As though maybe eight out of ten might do it. Some were just optional, some were mandatory. Which ones? Jesus lowers the ante to seven out of ten. He just quotes those that deal with our relationship to our neighbor, the second table of the law. And then with a straight face, can you imagine this? With a straight face, the man replied, all these I have kept since I have been a boy. <laughs> Jesus replied, oh, really? <laughs> Go and sell all you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And at that, the rich young man went away very sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Now the lesson here is uh, for another day, and it is another sermon. But this text precedes the text that we just heard as our gospel reading for today. Peter and the disciples saw this encounter between Jesus and the rich young man. And they immediately, in their minds, put two and two together. Aha! They have done just what Jesus told this rich young man to do. Therefore, they must have eternal life. Peter said to Jesus, See, we have left everything to follow you. What then will we have? So we all know the thought behind the question because, well, because we've all thought it. Are we going to be rewarded for our long service, our great sacrifices that we have made for the Lord? Or, or is the rumor true that if this rich young man despise the thought. But if this rich young man has a late life re religious conversion and makes a deathbed confession of his faith, will he actually be entitled to the whole shooting match? Eternal life? Oh, and certainly, certainly we're not asking this for ourselves. No, no. We're just trying to be practical because we understand that if this is the way that it really does work, Jesus, and if word gets out about this, Jesus, then everyone is just going to hold out to the last minute, Jesus, because you know how people are, Jesus. It is this thought that is buried in Peter's question that the Lord answers with this parable of the workers in the vineyard. And his point is crystal clear. The very thing that you don't want me to do, Peter, is precisely the thing that I do. Everyone who comes to me is paid in full, even who come at the last hour. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. So the thing that strikes us here right away is that this master of this house is one of those business managers who would never ever make it in today's economy. Today's competitive business climate demands that employers must do more with less. They must work their employees harder in order to preserve and protect their bottom line because the bottom line is what it's all about. The bottom line determines how many employees get hired or fired. And in a poor business climate, fewer employees are expected to do more work for the same pay. This is why the master of this house in this story seems so out of step to us. 
He's one of those overly generous humanitarian types whose heart gets in the way of his head. He lacks good business sense. He just loves to hire people to work in his vineyard. Evidently, there's enough work to do in the vineyard to keep as many people as will come into it employed. Five times a day, this master goes out to hire people. He's looking for workers for his vineyard because it gives him so much pleasure to hire them. And anyone who is idle and work, willing to work, he just hired on the spot. No resume, no background check, just come. Enter into my vineyard. Not because he needs their help. Not because he needs their labor. It's his vineyard. It's not because it'll fail if he doesn't get enough workers to do their share. No, for him it's all about the fact that men and women just need to be at work in his vineyard. It's for their sake that he hires them. So although this is certainly not the point of conflict in this story, you're going to miss the whole point of this story if you miss this point right here. The master of the house went out from his vineyard to bring in all whom he found. They did not look him up. They did not search on the web and come to him and beg him for a job in his vineyard. He went out, he found them, he invited them to come work for me. This, Jesus says, is what the kingdom of God is like. It comes down to his call to you and he calls you to enter into his vineyard. So to all of you rich young men and women out there, the kingdom of heaven is not something you must qualify for by your good resume or by your keeping 70% of the commandments. The kingdom of heaven is not like that. And to all of you disciples out there who are already in and employed by your master, do not expect to be rewarded based on the amount of your work that you do or the length of time that you've been here on the job. The kingdom of heaven is not like that. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. In other words, the kingdom of heaven is not about you at all. It's about the master of the house. This, of course, puts a whole new slant on our work in the kingdom of God, one that we're not used to putting on it. It turns Peter's question, see, we have left everything and followed you, what then shall we have? It turns the question upside down on its head. When you've been invited by the master to come into his vineyard to work it and to keep it, you've got it all, full stop. Adam had it all when God put him in the garden to work it and tend it. Can you just begin to imagine how absurd it would have sounded if Adam had said to the Lord, so if I work it really, really hard and give it my best effort, what will my reward be? <laughs> no, the payoff is being in the garden, working for the Lord. That's the reward. What this means is that all of our work and our service in the vineyard is pure privilege. To be done with pure joy, in pure gratitude for him who went out from the vineyard and found us and brought us in to work it and to keep it. Whatever we do in the name of the master of the vineyard, whether it be supporting foreign mission work, or the ministry of this local congregation, or the everyday labor of parenting, or neighboring, or working at the job that we are given to do, whatever it might be, whether we are working at our citizenship, or praying, 
whatever the work that is given us to do, it is never, never, never a means to an end. It is the end in itself. Rather, this is the end in itself because we are doing all of this at the invitation of the master of the house in his vineyard, which is located wherever you are in whatever vocation of life he has called you to be at work in. It's all his vineyard. This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. And up to this point, it's been a pretty nice story. And if this earthly story with its heavenly meaning had only just ended right here, we'd all be ready to say, put me to work in your vineyard, dear master. It is my pleasure. But it's never that simple with us, is it? Then comes payday and suddenly this cold breeze blows into the vineyard. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And so as strange as the hiring practices of this employer are, his practice for paying wages is even stranger. Everyone was paid the same. Those who were hired last, only got an hour's worth of work in, were paid the same as those who were hired in the ninth hour, who got a full day's work in, and the same as those in the sixth hour and the third hour, and those who were hired early in the morning, who had, as they put it, Born the burden of the day and the scorching heat. <laughs> they never did realize, did they, that they were working in the kingdom of heaven all along. And for those who were hired early in the day, for those who had lived so much of their life in the vineyard, in the kingdom of heaven, what had been such a blessed privilege suddenly becomes such burdensome work under oppressive conditions. Instead of being grateful for the wage that they were promised, they were ready to file a union grievance for unfair treatment. And on receiving their wage, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day in the scorching heat. The master's generosity and his free spirit were all well and good and nice enough in principle. And if it only had just remained a principle and nothing more, it would have probably been just fine with everybody. But when it is no longer just a principle and it becomes his practice, then suddenly it is not good. But he replied to one of them, one of them. And don't we just wish we knew which one in particular? Could it have been Peter? Could it have been you? Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me. And those, hit us, those words hit us like the jolt that comes from touching a live electric wire. Is he really allowed to do this? I mean, does he really have the right to act like this? Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? There's a lot of talk about rights swirling around these days. Inalienable rights, human rights, women's rights, civil rights, gay rights, animal rights, you name it, everyone's demanding their rights. But none of these challenge our notion of fairness and justice so much as when God demands his rights. And just what right is he claiming for himself? 
just this. It is his right to be generous. Or do you begrudge my generosity? So literally, in the Greek of the New Testament, it reads, is your eye bad because I am good? Is your eye bad because I am good? Why are you seeing my goodness as something bad? Everything was just fine until I was generous with others. You weren't even bothered that I hired freely, never complained that those latecomers were taking up the good paying jobs. It wasn't until you saw their paycheck that you grumbled about what I've given to you. Is your eye bad because I am good? Or do you begrudge me my generosity? I pray, dear friends, that you would not. For unless this master, this master is allowed to exercise his right to be generous, we are all doomed. What hope do we have except that this master exercises his right to be generous with us? For we are all in this same story. Where would any of us be if we got what we deserved for our labor in his vineyard? It is, in fact, the foolishness of this master's practice in hiring and paying out the wages that is our only hope. It is, in fact, only because he will not be denied his right to be generous that we do not despair. And so we must always keep in mind just who it is who is telling this parable. Jesus is the master of the vineyard. He is the generous one. He is allowed to do what he chooses with what belongs to him, and you belong to him. He has gone out from his vineyard, and he has found you. He has spoken his word to you. He has called you to come into my vineyard, and he has chosen to pay you the wages that are due you. And just what wages are due you? Well, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Those are the wages that are due you. And these are the wages that he has paid in full for you. By his foolish generosity, he has paid the wages due for your sin in full with his blood, whether you be the first or the last or anywhere in between. And so this sermon ends right where the parable ends. Am I not allowed to do what I cho choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge me my generosity? The parable ends with two question marks. It is now up to each one of us to give an answer to his question.